On Tech News Today, the Apple TV reviews are out. We'll tell you if it's worth the money. Plus, Oculus gets social, and a new Yamaha robot rides motorcycles so you don't have to. It's all coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, October 29th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is a low-cost automated investment service that's the most sophisticated way for you to invest your money. Whether you've got millions or just starting out, visit wealthfront.com slash TNT to sign up and get your free personalized investment portfolio. That's wealthfront.com slash TNT. And by ZipRecruiter, are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. My name is Mike Elgin, and our co anchor today is Fusion editor Kashmir Hill. Hey, Kashmir, what's going on? Hey, Mike, good morning. Good morning. Now, you wrote a, another uh, great piece uh, based on a stunt that you participated in, uh, the losing of phones. You and some others wanted to find out what happens when you drop your phone on the sidewalk and wander away. What, what does happen to a smartphone when you lose it? So you're not very likely to get your smartphone back mm. if you leave it in a restroom or in a park or as I did um, on the street in, in the Mission District of San Francisco. Um, I did this. Uh, I don't usually just like leave phones around. Um, <laughs> I <but> do. <laughs> I try not to. Um, a vast a digital security firm wanted to find out basically what happened when they left 20 phones around New York and San Francisco uh, but the trick about this was that they had loaded them with uh, security software or spyware so that when the phones were picked up, they could see what people did with them. Um, and a number, there were four of the 20 phones that were returned by Good Samaritans and the other 16 uh, kind of wandered about. There's one that's in India right now, another's in Dominican Republic. Uh, there is one in New York and one in San Francisco still, and the others were completely wiped um, and disappeared. But uh, the kind of the kind of creepy part about this was that Avast can still see what's happening on the phones. They can take over the camera and take pictures of people and their surroundings. Um, so uh, yeah, there are four people with phones that are kind of spying on them wow that's uh that's pretty expected i think and yeah. of course some people have done their own uh, accidental experiments like this where they had some service where their photos are automatically uploaded to the cloud and then somebody steals or they lose their phone and then they just can watch the pictures rolling in there was one person who worked on a disney cruise ship or something like that and and there were all these pictures of them you know they're just enjoying the phone sometimes uh the owner of the phone tries to get revenge by publicly shaming them and it turns out that the person bought the phone thinking that it was a legitimate legal phone uh so uh that's uh that's kind of weird uh but i also suspect that it has a lot to do with where you are i mean new york and san francisco of course are giant cities uh, and uh, I live in a tiny little town, and I've actually le left my brand new Retina iPad in in a grocery store uh, nearby twice. <laughs> and uh, you know, days later, I just call them up and say, "Hey, I, I left my I think I left my iPad there." Like, "Oh yeah, we have it. Just come in and get it." You know, and so it's uh, I think that in a lot of places it, it's gonna it's gonna you're, it's gonna be okay. But uh, but that's an interesting experiment and. You know, it's also a good idea to, for people to think about that. People leave their phones behind in Ubers and cabs and stuff like that all the time. And so it's a good idea to have some way to get get it. You know, make sure you set up Find My Phone or whatever the equivalent is on whatever phone you're using. Uh, because, you know, it happens all the time. And you're probably they're, you're probably not going to get good Samaritans. You're going to have to go and, and hunt them down and figure it out. So anyway, great piece at Fusion.net. Everybody should go read it. Well, why don't we jump into the regular news? The new version of Apple TV ships tomorrow, but already reviewers are giving it a try. David Katzmeyer, who's the review's section editor for CNET, wrote an extensive review, uh, and he joins us now to talk about it. A welcome to the show, David. Hey, Mike. Glad to be on. So glad you're on again. Now, before we get into the details, can you give us your general impression? How'd you like the new Apple TV? 
Um, I really liked it. Uh, I've reviewed, you know, every streaming box, uh, stick, puck, what have you out there. Um, it just feels uh, better. You know, I'm not an Apple person. I have an Android phone. You know, I use uh, Windows computers when I can. The, the Apple TV just drives around really slick. You can see in the background if you have the video feed, it, it's a very fast responding device. And it's got this touchpad remote, which really makes it feel uh, very different from another remote. Uh, the touchpad also allows a bunch of different control schemes that can give app developers uh, more ways to, you know, exploit the device. And you're able to talk to the device now? Yes. So Siri is now on your big screen. Uh, the way that it works, it's, it's a little bit more limited and, and the promise is a little more narrow than uh, Siri on a phone. Uh, the upside of that is that, you know, people don't expect, um, you know, to be able to ask it anything, although maybe since they already do on their phones, they do. Siri on the Apple TV is basically about, it works best finding stuff to watch. Uh, you can say stuff like, you know, tell me something good to watch and it'll come up with a list of stuff. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if this query is successful, um, you know, which often it is, uh, you'll get, you know, a bunch of uh, TV shows and movies to choose from. Most of them are on iTunes at the beginning, but it will search Netflix, uh, Hulu, uh, HBO, and stuff like that that you're subscribed to. Another cool trick it can do, you can navigate by voice. You can say, you know, skip 30 seconds ahead or skip a minute ahead. You can say, turn on subtitles. You can even ask, what did he say? If you miss a piece of dialogue and it'll flip back. 15 seconds, and if you're watching an iTunes video, it'll show you the, the subtitles. So stuff like that is on, and it's the, the voice functionality is head and shoulders above uh, other devices that are out there. Uh, unlike Alexa, um, it doesn't actually talk back, and it, there's no Siri voice. So you guys are used to that on your phones. There's no Siri voice on the Apple TV. It's just words uh, accompanied by the results on the screen so far. Maybe they'll turn that on in the future, but right now Siri is, is mute on the Apple TV. Steve Jobs uh, told his biographer, Walter Isaacs, and for the book, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, that, uh, quote, uh, no longer will users have to fiddle with complex remotes for DVD players and cable channels. It will have the simple, simplest user interface you can imagine. I finally cracked it, unquote. Was he talking about Siri? Maybe. Uh, I would like to be able to just ask my TV to, you know, show me something to watch or, or say, you know, I want to watch the Jets game and either schedule a recording when it comes on or flip to the live broadcast. Uh, that kind of stuff is not available yet, mainly because there isn't a live TV available yet on the Apple TV. You can authenticate uh, as many apps as your cable service allows, which means if you're an ESPN subscriber, for example, you can watch Watch ESPN on this device, like with a bunch of other devices out there. But there's no DVR functionality. Uh, there's none of the advanced stuff that we really want for live TV. Of course, the rumor is Apple will have a live TV subscription service next year, and that's apparently coming to all Apple devices, including the, uh, the new Apple TV and, you know, the old one, if rumor has it correctly. So maybe Apple will have cracked it by the time that TV service comes out. But I think the, the judging from Sling TV and other uh, subscription services that we have today, um, there's going to be plenty of restrictions. And Apple's having a really hard time, even for a company that powerful, negotiating with uh, companies uh, like CBS, NBC, the real content owners uh, with you know, actually making these contracts work for everybody. So it's a tough thing. It's not going to happen immediately. This device is definitely an evolution, but it's still one of the better uh, streaming devices that I've ever used. Yeah, this is one of the huge challenges moving forward, the kind of traditional cable model meeting mm -hmm. the way that we like to, to meet, uh, the way that we like to consume uh, TV and entertainment now. Um, are there any downsides to Apple TV beyond not being able to access live TV very easily? Well, the main downside, again, is, is if you're not an Apple person, like I'm not an Apple person, uh, you know, I don't haven't bought anything on iTunes, movies, and TV. Um, so when I go to those things, it's, it's, there's nothing there because I buy my stuff on Amazon. Well, surprise, surprise, there's no Amazon app mm -hmm. on this device. So you can't, if you're an Amazon, you know, you can't watch your free Prime videos. You can't watch stuff you bought on Amazon. You can't listen to Amazon Music. Uh, you know, apps like Sling TV, which I mentioned before, which is a, a, a live internet broadcaster, are not available on Apple TV. So the app support isn't there. You can use AirPlay to watch, uh, which is a little function on your iPhone or iPad that you can kind of cast uh, what's on the screen or, 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 you know, watch apps on the big screen via Apple TV that way. But it's not the same as having the deep integration with Siri and all the other cool things you get with a real native Apple TV app. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's got that downside. It's obviously more expensive than other devices out there. And again, you know, the, the real pluses that it has, the gaming and all the apps and everything, uh, you know, they're mainly bought for uh, screens that you can touch and, and smaller screens. And a lot of them don't translate all that well onto the big screen yet. I think developers will get a handle on that soon. 
Um, gaming is, is a whole other thing that, you know, reigns to be seen whether people want to play Candy Crush on a 65-inch TV. Um, and, of course, there's other apps like, you know, shopping apps and things like that that um, don't necessarily translate nearly as well as they would uh, on your phone. So, again, this is very, very early days for Apple TV in the App Store. So it'll be really interesting to see how this new platform is exploited. You mentioned the high price. Uh, the one, uh, the 32 gigabyte model is $149. The 64 gig model is $199. Do you think it's worth the price? Uh, absolutely not. I, I, that's a great question, Mike. There's there's a lot of stuff Apple wanted to talk about in terms of their new aggressive uh, storage management. So you know people are trained these days to buy the most expensive uh, iPhone because you're going to fill it up with uh, you know photos and video. That's not the case with Apple TV. It streams everything from the cloud photos and video. So you know, you're left with games being the main thing that's going to take up your storage. They have a very aggressive system that they call on-demand resources ODR, TVOS, which is the new operating system for Apple TV. That really mandates a very small uh, size, 200 megabytes. Um, this is a 32 gig uh, you know, device base, so you do the math. That's a lot of apps you can fit on there. And then each app can grab stuff at will. So when I first turned on Asphalt, which is a pretty big game, uh, it took a you know, minute or two to download all that stuff that you need. And if you don't play that game for a while and your Apple TV starts to fill up, the OS will automatically go in and delete those large chunks of data. And they mentioned something about a 10 gigabyte limit uh, on, on these apps in general. And that's huge. Uh, but you know, again, that stuff will get deleted if you don't play it. You can always re-download stuff. So at the end of the day, I think most people are fine with the 32 gig version, even if you're going to be downloading a whole bunch of apps. If you're crazy, have a lot of money to burn, fine, get the 64, you want to play a lot of games, uh, you know, really take advantage of the gaming on this thing. But otherwise, go for 32. Awesome. And when, if you do buy one, make sure you watch Tech News Today every single day. David Katzmeyer is at CNET.com and on Twitter at D Katzmeyer. David, thanks for joining us today. Anytime. All right. Thank you. We've got some more news coming up, including news about uh, a robotic motorcycle rider and also virtual reality. But first, I want to talk about Wealthfront. Wealthfront is the way to grow your money and not only grow your money, but grow your money without losing money on unnecessary taxes on unnecessary fees to your advisor. Uh, traditional advisors charge huge fees between 1% and 3% of what you got under management, plus hidden fees for transactions and charges. You get nickeled and dimed, and it's kind of expensive when you'd rather be investing that money and hanging on to it. When you sign up for a, a, an account at Wealthfront.com, in just a few minutes, it goes to work, monitoring your portfolios around the clock and taking action as soon as opportunities arises. Uh, whether you're investing for retirement or other goals, uh, it uh, takes care of all of that and rebalances your portfolio and reinvests your dividends, all commission-free. That's the great part about this. You pay one quarter of 1% a year, that's 25 basis points, zero commissions, and no hidden fees. That's five bucks a month to invest a $30,000 account, for example. And there are no additional charges for any of Wealthfront's services. They manage over $2.6 billion in client assets, and it's grown over 20 times in the past two years. you got to check this out. Visit Wealthfront.com slash TNT to sign up and get your free personalized investment portfolio. You'll see the customized allocation they recommend for your portfolio. And just for you, Twit listeners and viewers, if you sign up to invest, Wealthfront will manage your first $15,000 entirely free of charge for life. Claim your offer today at Wealthfront.com slash TNT. TNT, and we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. For compliance purposes, I have to tell you that Wealthfront Inc. is an SEC-registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are offered through Wealthfront Brokerage Corporation, member FINRA and SIPC. This is not a solicitation to buy or sell securities. Investing in securities involves risks, and there is a possibility of losing money. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Please visit Wealthfront.com to read their full disclosure. All right, Oculus VR yesterday rolled out its multiplayer mode for its cinema app. It's called Oculus Social Alpha. Ben Lang is the co-founder and executive editor of Road to VR. Welcome to the show, Ben. Hey, thanks, Mike. It's good to be here. Glad you're here as well. Uh, in almost virtual reality, sort of, kind of. Sitting in a movie theater probably isn't the most heart-pounding VR experience, but this is something of a milestone, isn't it? It is. So this is Oculus's first time delving into uh, the social world, which is, you know, VR is great, but when you're in there immersed by yourself, uh, it's 
it's actually more immersive to have people there that are real, um, that you can speak to and interact with. So there are a number of other social applications that have been released um, and are out there right now available and, and growing. Uh, but this is Oculus's very first attempt to do that. Um, so they're calling it alpha, which is uh, a lot of people you know, might think that that means it's going to be buggy and stuff. But right now, it's actually not about bugginess, I think. It's more about features. Um, so yeah, right now, the features are basically you can sit in a room with up to six people total and you can watch uh, you can watch Twitch or you can watch Vimeo with those people and you can talk with them and you're just seeing it on a flat screen. So I think it's alpha in the sense that they're just experimenting now with how the how the social interactions are going to work. Uh, but later on down the road this is going to expand beyond just being able to watch some simple you know flat uh, video on a wall and actually being able to interact in very immersive and significant ways inside of that virtual space. And is it, uh, it seems like it's pretty limited. So you guys can't leave the room or walk around together. Is that just too much of a challenge for them at this point in, in terms of programming that, designing that? It, it's not too much of a challenge. I think it's actually a design consideration. So uh, navigation in virtual worlds is actually, uh, when you're immersed so deeply in there, it's actually kind of an open question right now. What is the best way to get around? Because for a lot of people, if you're going to use a game pad and just you know hold the stick forward to walk forward, um, your virtual body is moving forward and the world around you is moving as though you're walking forward in real life, um, but you're not walking forward in real life. And your body doesn't respond very well uh, to seeing all those normal visual cues of movement, but not feeling any of the uh, physical cues of movement. And so this has been a long ongoing process of experimenting uh, what is the best way to move people people around or maybe even not move people around. In the case of Oculus Social, uh, their social alpha app that they just launched, you're just sitting in these seats and then the, the movement that you have so far is uh, you swipe on the touchpad of the Gear VR and you'll just basically instantly transport from one seat to another if there's an open one. Uh, so that's the extent of the, of the navigation in that space so far. Um, and that's kind of pending finding out a better way or you know maybe we don't necessarily need to walk around in, in these sorts of virtual situations uh, but yeah it's it's I mean it's one of the reasons why it's alpha at this point um, there will probably be more interactions more navigation maybe going down uh, going down the road rather than just being able to teleport from one chair to another it's kind of uh, uh, weird that uh, you know the first app uh, that's social is uh, sitting in a movie theater, which which is doesn't seem to me to be a very compelling experience. I mean, it's like, hmm, how do we improve watching a movie? People talking. <laughs> that's a great yeah, idea. Yeah. <laughs> but it, but I do think it's significant. Of course, Oculus is owned. Oculus VR is owned by Facebook, and Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has said multiple times that the future of social is in virtual reality. And I think that you know that is an absolute certainty. People are going to be hanging out with each other. Uh, in real time through avatars initially and then probably through uh, some option to have your actual uh, actual self represented to some extent within VR. Uh, and that is really interesting. So this, of course, is not, you know, the, the Oculus Rift platform, for example, is not out there, so you can't use it on that. Who gets to use this feature and where can they get it? Yeah, so right now, this just launched yesterday on the Gear VR headset. So this is Samsung's headset that was made in conjunction with Oculus. Um, so you can think of this kind of as Oculus's mobile offering. It runs off of a smartphone. Uh, there's a couple different ones that it's compatible with. You can pick up one of these headsets for $99 now. Uh, there's actually a new one coming out uh, toward the end of the year. So wait if you haven't bought one yet. Um, but so yeah, you can download it uh, directly. If you launch the Oculus app on your phone, if you have the Gear VR, uh, you can download it for free right now and try it today. Uh, you can jump into any one of those rooms and uh, sit there and chat with people watching Vimeo and uh, Twitch right now. Netflix uh, also actually has an app already, but it's not uh, social enabled. And so it'll probably get there. And I'm, I'm you know, personally looking forward to that because you know, yeah, sure. Uh, watching f basically flat traditional video uh, in VR is not super exciting, but as soon as you add that social aspect to it, it becomes uh, twice as good as it would be otherwise. Because you know, otherwise you're just sitting in a virtual space watching uh, a movie on a wall. But feeling like you're actually sitting next to somebody uh, really, really adds to both the immersion and kind of the usefulness of of virtual reality. Uh, so they've been working really hard, Oculus. 
uh, on making this 3D positional audio uh, that's really good. So when someone is sitting in the chair next to you, you're both watching the screen and they talk to you, you hear it really convincingly uh, on the side where they're coming from. So it really starts to add uh, this feeling of being in these you know, social zones with people. It's very interesting. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned yeah, o Oculus is owned by Facebook now. Um, and actually, if you look into some of the early developer uh, documentation for this uh, social alpha program, uh, there's like a code of conduct, which is very Facebook-like, uh, you know, things like, you know, no racial slurs, uh, you know, no hate speech, that sort of thing. So even though there are these little lobbies of up to only six people, um, it's almost like uh, it's kind of being watched in the same way that you might think your, your Facebook posts are being watched. Um, so that's, I think, an interesting thing to think about going forward. Uh, Facebook is obviously looking at the future of virtual reality having, you know, millions or billions of people in VR. Um, but then they kind of get to make the rules here. They get to moderate and uh, monitor these these spaces if they'd like. Uh, so something something to be thought about uh, when looking at the various, I think, social platforms that are out there and, and the openness uh, and freedoms that can exist within them. And Ben, what is like uh, what is the virtual world like right now? Is it mostly friends connecting with friends, or are, are you kind of expecting to go into these rooms and, and meet strangers, interact with people that you're not otherwise connected to? Yeah, so the social alpha is, is Oculus is one uh, specific app so far that does allow you to connect uh, with other people. Right now, there are just a couple of lobbies that you see when you enter into there, and you can join any one of them, and they're just random people in there. Um, as far as I'm aware, the, the very first launch here doesn't have uh, any support to connect with a specific person. You can't type in a username and join a specific friend. Yeah, the lobby's there on the screen. Um, so you just pop into one of those, and it's that's kind of it. It's whoever jumps in there, you can talk with them, and uh, that's neat. But uh, right now, there's no friends list set up. But that's of course all coming down the road. You know, there's going to be uh, at some point should be easy, and probably will be easy to say, here are all my VR friends, and you can join them in various social applications. Uh, as far as the broader virtual social uh, world, I, I mentioned there's other companies working on other apps out there, um, and some of them are further ahead in terms of having a friends list um, and being able to actually see where that person is uh, within that virtual app and be able to jump jump into where they are and uh, uh, join them more easily. Very nice. Ben Lang is at RoadToVR.com and on Twitter at BenZ145. Ben, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Mike. Yamaha unveiled a robot at this week's Tokyo Motor Show that rides motorcycles so you don't have to. It's called Motobot and it's designed to ride Yamaha's R1M motorcycle. Ashley Osqueda is a senior editor at CNET and host and producer of CNET's Tomorrow Daily Show. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Mike. So glad you're on. Now, how does Motobot work? Does it use the same controls as a human rider? Does it does it gun the uh, handlebars and that sort of thing? It's pretty interesting. So there are six actuators on this robot, and they handle uh, different things. So steering, throttle, front brake, rear brake, clutch, and the gear shift pedal. So uh, there are sensors on the bike. And um, they kind of understand. It helps the robot understand exactly how to steer the uh, how to steer the motorcycle, which is pretty impressive, and also react to condi conditions that might be on the track. So if there are hazards or uh, you know if there's a curve coming up ahead, anything like that, uh, it can kind of react to that. Uh, so there, it's it's not modified. The bike has not been modified. Uh, with the exception of they have training wheels that they put on it to make sure the robot doesn't lay the bike down. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it can it can accelerate, it can adjust uh, just like a just like a person would, which is pretty impressive. So humans usually ride motorcycles because they enjoy the experience, um, but robots don't really get that out of it. What's the point of having a robot that rides a motorcycle? Is this like a advanced crash test dummy? Um, sort of. So what the Yamaha's goal uh, in all of this is to improve rider safety and also rider uh, features on uh, the bike. So support systems. So what they want to do is uh, through testing this robot and developing Motobot to help it uh, kind of become a better rider. So so to speak, uh, they're going to learn a lot about how uh, riders react to things. Obviously, uh, with a robot, you're going to have a, maybe a little bit quicker reaction to uh, different stuff, but they want to kind of learn uh, and, and throughout the process of helping the robot, uh, I believe the final goal is by 2017, they want to have it lap a racetrack 
at 200 kilometers per hour or faster, which is pretty, pretty intense. But, um, but they want to use all of the data through developing that and, and aiming towards that goal. They'd like to use that data to help writers safety and also, uh, you know, develop better support systems for writers uh, and understand a little bit better, like what they what exactly they need in certain situations. Or maybe this could be the motorcycle equivalent of, uh, of a self-driving car where you just ride on the back or sit on the handlebars or something like this. And <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing. Wouldn't that be I, it actually, great idea? It actually <laughs> reminded me of the, uh, the motorcycle bike, uh, the robot bike cops in the Star Trek reboot. Or they're uh, chasing after young, uh, young Kirk, Captain Kirk, and uh, and he and they're just these like kind of really slick, futuristic looking robots on motorcycles. Uh, but those ones hover, so not quite there yet. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty pretty interesting stuff. I mean, I I saw this uh, yesterday. They they introduced it and unveiled it at the uh, Tokyo Motor Show, and it I guess it's a little bit overconfident. This robot's pretty interesting. It wants to. It sent a message to the MotoGP world champion, uh, Valentino Rossi, and said it was made to surpass him and has kind of issued this challenge to him. And Yamaha wants to be able to, uh, you know, pit this robot against Valentino Rossi's sort of ghost slap times. Uh, so they, they're they like, we think that he can compete at some point in terms of uh, an actual human rider, which, I mean, I'll be excited when that day comes. Uh, today's not that day, but definitely, uh, definitely looking forward to that. Definitely looking forward to that time trial. Ashley, do you know how much it costs to to build the motorbot? Uh, I don't believe y'all has talked about the cost of how much it's uh, spent putting motorbot together. Uh, but I definitely, I mean, the bike itself isn't cheap, and then on top of that, to be able to sort of build a robot that can handle a bike uh, like a human, I, I can't imagine would be inexpensive in any way, shape, or form. I mean, just the, I mean, just the actuators, I, it's just, I mean, it's a, it's a really impressive robot and, and for it to be as small as it is, it's about the size of a human writer. Uh, that's, I, man, I can't, I can't even begin to imagine the cost. Ashley, are you at the Tokyo Motor Show? Are you in Tokyo? I wish I was in Tokyo every day, uh, but no, <laughs> sadly, I'm not in Tokyo at the Tokyo Motor Show. Um, I actually believe uh, our one of our intrepid editors at large, Tim Stevens, who yeah, is, of course. Uh, visited. Yeah, he's the he's the big car guy. So him and Brian Cooley, uh, I believe uh, Tim was at the Tokyo Motor Show and is coming home today. I think I think I saw him to tweet, uh, tweet or otherwise post about being at the air at Narita. So. Uh, he was there, and he got to. I'm, I'm assuming he got to see it and check it out, and I'm a little bit jealous. Yeah, absolutely. And he's got to watch out for his job. This motorcycle wants to take his job as well. So he <laughs> yeah, learns how to write. Spare time and his hobbies, because that's he loves to ride bikes as as his hobby. So yeah. I uh, I kind of love the idea of Tim Stevens having a, a robot motorcycle gang. I think that would be pretty awesome. <laughs> a frightening thought uh, for sure. <laughs> uh, all right, oh, so they'd, come on, they'd go, come on, Mike. They'd go around and do good deeds for people. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, get yeah. cats out of trees and stuff. They'd be great motorcycle games. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> Ashley Escada is at CNET.com and also AshleyEscada.com. And you can find her on Twitter at Ashley Escada. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ashley. Thanks, Mike. Google X's Project Loon is now going to test its high-altitude internet balloons to bring connectivity to Indonesia, the world's fourth largest country. Indonesia has a population of 250 million people who live on something like 922 different islands. Some two-thirds of Indonesians don't have access to the Internet, and the project's goal is to bring a whopping 100 million Indonesians onto the Internet. Google's working with the nation's three big carriers on the trial. Kashmir Hill, this is an awesome use for Project Loon because, again, Indonesia is just hundreds and hundreds of islands, and it's so hard to connect all those people uh, to the Internet, and this will just make it happen. This does seem like the ideal use case. Though every time I go to the Google Loon site and just look at internet uh, powered by balloons, it feels like an April Fool's Day joke. It's it's amazing um, that this is the the technology that we're using. It really is, and of course, this is a mesh networking where the uh, connectivity is relayed from balloon to balloon, and uh, the there's a lot of sophisticated technology that. Uh, you know, that self navigates to a certain extent where they, you know, of course, with balloons, you have to, uh, you have to navigate by, you know, hitching a ride on various wind currents. 
And so it's it all it's all pretty crazy, and it does sound unlikely <laughs> that this would work, but in fact, it has been proven to work. And so uh, we're going to be getting going to be getting a lot of uh, a lot more Indonesians online, which is just great. And uh, hopefully, all of them will watch Tech News today. So we'll see if we get some <laughs> some additional uh, viewers and listeners uh, through this. All right, well, in uh, mergers and acquisitions news, IBM is acquiring weather.com, sp speaking of high-altitude uh, uh, wind patterns. The company agreed yesterday to buy all digital properties owned by the weather company, including WSI, weather.com, Weather Underground, and the weather company brand. The Weather Channel TV property, however, is not included. IBM will not be acquiring the TV channel. The weather company, by the way, is jointly owned by NBC Universal, the Blackstone Group, and Bain Capital. Very cool. They're going to use some of their... AI to uh, to get into the weather business. Yeah, I'm so curious what IBM is going to be able to do with that data, um, with the big data analysis tools that they've built around Watson. Yeah. Um, hopefully, IBM will have a weather app for us very soon. I hope so. I hope so. All right. Well, we got some more uh, news coming right up. But first, let's talk about ZipRecruiter. Hiring is, uh, I've said it before, the most important thing you're going to do. If you have a small business or if you're a manager or even if you just need an assistant, you have to hire the best person. And who is the best person? The best person is that person who's just right for your company. It's not always the most qualified person. It's oftentimes the person who has the right combination of skills, uh, uh, motivation, um, personality, whatever it is. You want to hire the best person. You do that by casting the widest possible net with your job, uh, with your job post. And on ZipRecruiter, you can do that to 100-plus job boards, including social networks, with one single click. Social networks include Facebook, Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn, et cetera. And uh, this is the greatest way to do it. And, of course, with such a wide net cast, you're going to get lots and lots of respondents, some of whom are going to be qualified, others won't be. Uh, but ZipRecruiter makes it super easy for you to filter out the unqualified candidates so you can really focus on those people who are by far the most uh, qualified uh, we have a user testimonial from a happy user named Dan who said, the hardest part about running a business when you need to hire is that you have to spend extra time recruiting while you're short-staffed. But with ZipRecruiter, I've gotten quality candidates within 24 hours of posting a job. ZipRecruiter's website makes this process so much faster by letting me manage candidates in one place. There's really no way to describe what ZipRecruiter does. You have to go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT and check it out for yourself. There's all kinds of resources there. Even before you sign up, there's a great blog. There's all kinds of features and options all laid out for you. And of course, you can get that first job. You can get that first hire for free. Today, you can try ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TNT. We thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Today. In news you can lose, a bug in the latest iOS release is causing people to be late for work. A new feature of iOS 9.0 called Overnight Updates enables people to get the latest version of iOS while they sleep. But when iOS 9.1 hit this week, some users got the new version but didn't get woken up by the alarms they had set because of this bug. Apple says they're going to fix it. And, of course, if you lost your job because you were late, again, please refer to my ZipRecruiter ad just now. <laughs> it was funny. I was recently with a bunch of people and we were talking about what we do to uh, disconnect from technology. And one woman said she she uh, will not let her iPhone into her bedroom. And everyone else is like, well, how do you wake up in the morning? <laughs> She's like, I have an alarm clock. Uh, but that's really one of those technologies that's kind of gone extinct in the uh, era of the smartphone. It absolutely, it's absolutely true. Everybody uses their phones nowadays. I personally uh, have to get up super early to prepare for the show. And so I have three alarms. Uh, I have my phone and I, yeah, it's right there uh, next to the bed. And uh, I also have a regular alarm clock, which is in an, it's really loud and it's in another room. And then I also have an iPad alarm set. So um, I basically get woken up by my phone and then I turn off the other two before they go off. And uh, it's, a, it's a weird ritual, but I'm so paranoid about, you know, waking up at nine <laughs> one of these wow. days. I just, I just can't uh, take any chances with that. So uh, that's what I do. So. You make sacrifices for tech news today. What I wouldn't do for you, the audience. <laughs> it's just <laughs> breathtaking. Well, anyway, uh, our TNT fan of the day is David Campbell in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Florida who posted this picture on Google+. He's watching TNT on a Disney magic cruise. And downloading Tech News Today cost him a fortune because he was on a cruise ship, but he says it was worth it because he can't go without TNT. 
I was really hoping for a Disney princess in the background of this photo. I know. Come on. Next time, uh, <laughs> we need to see those princesses or at least a, 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 a magical mouse. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT so we can find it. And uh, we don't get very many on Facebook these days. We get lots on Twitter. We get lots on uh, Google+, a few on Instagram. And we got a whole bunch of Facebook uh, posts for a while, and then they just stopped. So if you're on Facebook, uh, take a picture right now. Show us how you watch TNT and throw it on Facebook. We want to get Facebook uh, in there as well. Cashmere Hill, uh, you have any uh, more awesome stunts planned? Well, tomorrow, <laughs> based on your advice, Mike, um, I, I'm heading to Doppler Labs to try out those uh, earphones you were telling me about, the hear, to, nice. to eliminate the things I don't want to hear in my sonic environment. <laughs> That's great. I can't wait to hear your uh, your experience with those, um, you know, they make a lot of claims, but I personally don't know anybody who's tried them. So that's going to be great to to read your report. And again, I think that's the future of what's going to be happening in everybody's ears. You know, I think, you know, give it five years and we're all just going to have, you know, we're going to get up in the morning and plug plug these things in our ears and and uh, and and leave them in there all day until we until the end of the day. It's going to be pretty great. Can't wait to read it. Kashmir Hill at Cash Hill with a K on Twitter. Thank you so much, Kashmir, for uh, co-anchoring today, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Mike. See you next week. Right, Bye-bye. Let us know what's on your mind. Send us email to tnt at twit.tv or call 260-TNT-SHOW. That's 260-868-7469. You can subscribe to Tech News Today on Stitcher or choose some other way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. You can also watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1700 UTC at twit.tv slash live. And please follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash TV. And you can follow me personally at elgin.com. Also, don't miss our other news show, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific every single weeknight. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. The show is produced by Jason Cleanthus and edited by Anthony Nielsen. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.